presentation of this, uh, this session, so by Sebastian König, who will talk on biotic homogenization of orthoptero assemblages in the Hasberge, so in Bayern. Uh, and the title is already quite similar to <laughs> Sophie's, so apparently the results are quite similar. So I'm very much looking forward. Thank you. So, good afternoon also from my side. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Sebastian. I'm from the vicinity of Würzburg. This is a really uh, nice region in the in north of Bavaria with uh, nice species-rich calcareous grasslands. And I guess this is where I um, got fascinated by Autoptera when I was a young child. A little bit to my... Um, Background the last couple of years, I did a lot of field trips, uh, also to mountain ecosystems like uh, the Rila Mountains or the Perrine Mountains in Bulgaria or even the Drakensberg Mountain Range in South Africa and Lesotho. But I spent most of the time in the European Alps, like mostly in the National Park Berchtesgaden in Germany. And um, also did empirical assessments there. Um, I'd like to present you the results or the first results of two case studies, which I have to admit, uh, both of the topics have been covered today, so this, uh, this is why I don't have to talk very much about uh, the method part and maybe just show you a lot of uh, cool photos of Autoptera. <laughs> it's even uh, late in the evening now. Yeah. Um, the first one would be on uh, feeding interactions uh, along a microclimatic gradient, and therefore we sampled uh, did botanical assessments of the vascular plant species and uh, mosses on 40 study sites along a gradient of uh, temperature close to the ground um, throughout Bavaria. Um, and what we did on these sites is, uh, besides the plant assessments, we also uh, uh, sampled or surveyed the autoptera communities. And on the other hand, we collected field observations of uh, feeding interactions only between autoptera and plants, not between autoptera and other insects. Uh, we did this for five years now, so I gathered a lot of data, but as you might know, this uh, field observations of feeding interactions can be really exhaustive and you need a lot of patience for that, so we decided to also use uh, another method, which was all also uh, presented today, this uh, collection of fecal samples. We did it almost in the same way. Um, and then later on, laboratory workflow with DNA metabarcoding to estimate the, the diets of the autoptera species. Yeah, what we found there was uh, an increase in species richness and abundance of autoptera with temperature, but also with plant species richness. Uh, the proportion of Gomphotserine or the grasshoppers within autoptera assemblages was uh, highest when the grass cover was highest and it tended to degrees with, uh, with temperature. Uh, where, whereas the plant uh, species richness peaked at intermediate uh, temperatures. When we uh, take a look at the diets, which uh, I show here, um, derived from the metabarcoding uh, data set, we can see as expected a phylogenetic clustering within uh, the plant species that were eaten by different lineages of Autoptera with uh, high proportions of uh, algae and mosses, for example, in tetrakids, and high proportions of grasses in uh, grasshoppers, with a few exceptions, of course. Uh, the picture changes when we go into Ötipodine or Tedigonids or Melanopline, where they uh, feed on a much broader range of, uh, of resource plants. Yeah, during these um, field surveys, we also observed some interesting sightings of uh, autoptera populations, like this uh, Cotypus populations in, in the Berchtesgaden Alps, which remind me a lot of uh, Eisentrauts bobbing grasshopper. I have uh, many pictures of them with me, so for those I interested, we can maybe later on or tomorrow take a look at them. I guess they're some sort of hybrids or something. Um, this is what an example network on um, site level would look like. You have the plant species, the plant phylogeny on top, and as rows, the autoptera species which occurred on this uh, study site. And uh, what directly catches the eye is that there's a, a high proportion of grasses in the, in the diets of the, 
uh, Gomfort Serena, which are in the lower rows here. It differs for the Tetigonid species, which are in the upper part. Yeah, so the first uh, question we were asking us is if the specialization, uh, if we can me measure them in any way, is changing along this uh, temperature gradient. And we, uh, we tried to do this by using this um, phylogenetic structure of specialization index or on the same way the phylogenetic specialization uh, index based on dietary uh, phylogenetic relationships. Uh, and this is measured as uh, the mean pairwise distances in the diets compared to a null model, which is based on the botanical assessments on the study sites. And what we see there is that on a samplage level, we find the highest specialization uh, uh, values in, in intermediate temperatures. And we looked at this also at species level a little bit for those species which occur on a, on a larger range along this uh, elevational gradient. And uh, there was not so much change within species, so we, we think this might be uh, explained by a turnover in species often, this pattern. Now leaving this uh, spatial temperature gradient and going on to a, a temporal temperature gradient, this is a study very similar to the one uh, Sophie presented before. We did a reassessment of uh, around 200 study sites in north of Bavaria. And the results match very good with that uh, what you presented. Uh, we also had wet mesic ruderal and dry grassland sites there. The f they were first uh, sampled in 1988 uh, and then reassessed in 2004. And now we did the reassessment in 2019, always uh, using the same methodology. And all those people involved in the study uh, were also sampling. Yeah, what we see is that temperatures were increasing over the study period um, and the composition, so incidence based uh, of the autoptera assemblages, the compositional differences between these grassland types decrease over time, which is also an indication for this uh, better diversity decline. Uh, looking at the species themselves, we uh, um, could not detect some of the species which were formerly there on the study sites anymore, like the Cotopos vagans, the heath grasshopper, or the rattle grasshopper, for example. But uh, those were formerly also rare on the study sites. Uh, other for um, some of the formerly widespread species, uh, species like uh, Pseudocotopos montanus, or very pronounced Omocestus viridulus, also the common green grasshopper, they lost a lot of their incidences in the, in the study region, on the study sites, also on the wet meadows. On the other hand, we found strong increases for quite uh, a number of species. One species was new for the study region, it was a uh, European tree cricket, Eucanthus, and uh, most pronounced, the step grasshopper, Cotopus dosatus, also increased in this region of, of Germany. Uh, paralleled by um, Cotopus bigotulus and Cotopus mollis, as well as uh, Cetophyma grossum or uh, Oedipoda cerealescens. Yeah, looking at the traits, we had um, also an increase in alpha diversity, so the number of species at, all, uh, at almost all of the study sites and in all uh, habitat types, but we found that the differences between the habitat types decreased, uh, and this is uh, maybe due to the loss of uh, specialists, both adapted to dry or to either dry or wet uh, habitat types, and a an parallel increase, a strong increase in general species, which also occur under warmer um, microclimates, as indicated by um, the increasing macroclimatic preference. Uh, this is the measure from Thomas Fatman's group, the Community Temperature Index. Good. As I also am, I'm quite hungry now, I just uh, show you some impressions of, of my last field trips with some uh, interesting species sightings. We also heard about Paracaloptinus today. This is, uh, uh, these are photos from Bulgaria. And here also from high altitude uh, grasslands uh, like Psorodonotus fiberi. Oh, here, this uh, 
It's also a nice photo of the speckled buzzing grasshopper up here. And let's hope that this uh, Gomfutze ribus found a, a, matching, a matching female in the end, because he, he tried hard. <laughs> ah, not successful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Mm. Very nice end of this session. Are there questions from the audience? I think it's, it's very interesting that your results match so well with ours and uh, we had some discussions during the coffee break also with Thomas and, uh, who had this uh, study in Austria and I know that uh, Thomas Fartmann also made uh, similar studies in, in Münsterland and so on and they all appear to go in the same direction mm -hmm. yeah, which, which means that they actually are quite a good basis also for future red list assessments probably. There's a question by Shimon. Yeah, Shimon uh, Yeah, I, very, very interesting. I, I, I thought that the decline, I think the highest decline was in Stenobotrus stigmaticus, right? Am I right? Yeah, but it was only two occurrences before. Ah, okay. Uh, but because, I mean, yeah. we, in Poland, I think it's less in one region. I mean, it's not me doing the, the field work, but a colleague of us from the Atlas, too. He, he's kind of doing similar similar thing, and he found, like, an extreme decline. And you, I think, you when you look, you kind of, you can that kind of put a hypothesis that it is mm. really declining and I was wondering if you have any hypothesis but if, if it's two records then maybe it's difficult it's to tell records, anything. But it's, yeah, it's interesting that also some of these dry specialist species are decreasing and I think this can also be the result of microclimatic uh, conditions which change in the habitats like, like uh, more plant growth or whatever which changes uh, yeah, microclimatic conditions. Yeah, thank you.